Uh, my name is C. Morgan Gruff, and I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island Historical Society. And right now we're here up in the, uh, the stacks of the Rhode Island Historical Society Library on the east side of Providence. Today we have an assortment of books from our collection that we felt have both a local and a national significance for you. The first few books that I want to start with today are actually related to Roger Williams, probably the most famous founder of Rhode Island. There were more than one for the colony of Rhode Island. so. Uh, Roger Williams gets the most attention, and these books are some of the reasons why. The first book we're going to look at today is called The Key into the Language of America, and it was published in 1643. It's an original binding, so it is kept in this case. This book is 1643, and it is the first ever dictionary of an Indian language in English. This is an original printing, printed by Gregory Dexter. So these are London imprints. These were not printed in the colony of Rhode Island. But this became an amazingly important book, not just in the 17th century, uh, where it does show, in fact, Roger Williams' claim on the land that becomes Rhode Island. It shows his relationship and the closeness with which he has worked with the native peoples of Rhode Island, such as the Narragansett. Uh, but it also is used through the 17th, 18th, 19th, and into the 20th century as one of the only dictionaries and keys to the language of Al Algonquin-speaking people. So it really is an amazing work that retained its significance well into the 20th century. This book was incredibly well known and well used, and it wasn't a book of much controversy. Unlike his next book, which we're going to be looking at, which was just one year later, published in 1644, without his name or the name of the printer, Gregory Dexter, on this book. And this book is in a new binding, so we can hand a little bit more gingerly. And it is the famous Bloody Tenant of Persecution. This is really where we see Roger Williams talking about the idea of liberty of conscience and the freedom of religion. He is very much showing at this point why he is different and why his thinking is different and why Rhode Island will be different from Massachusetts, the Plymouth Bay Colony, and the other colonies to the north. He was creating a land where people could come, could worship as they chose, and would always be protected by the civil law. Roger Williams, uh, while he was a member of the clergy, was also incredibly trained and learned in civil law and actually worked for uh, Sir Cook in the British Parliament and in the Star Chamber. And we see a lot of his ideas of civil law and separation of church and state begun uh, to be articulated in texts like this. And this did not, of course, sit well with England or with Massachusetts. By an act of British Parliament, all of the copies of this book were set to be burned. Luckily, not all of them were. This copy was not, and we're able to show that to people today who use it. This didn't go unnoticed by people here in the colonies. This next book, a contemporary binding of this, is actually a response to the bloody tenant. This response, the bloody tenant washed and made white in the blood of the lamb, is a response by Cotton. It comes just a couple years later, and a few years after that, Roger William replies to him, and then Cotton replies again. So over the span of about 10 years, you see the back and forth battle of words as these men discuss the deepest of philosophical ideas that then become really, in many ways, Roger Williams' thoughts, some people argue, the founding of the First Amendment of the United States. It is here where we see that separation of church and state articulated and argued over the course of a decade. Arguably, one of the most important things that Roger Williams really does bring to this colony that differentiates it from the others that are formed, even from Quaker Pennsylvania later on, is this idea of true liberty of conscience. Historians have argued through the 20th century that this has not just an effect on the First Amendment, on the Declaration, on the Constitution, but even an effect on the economy of Rhode Island and how it developed, because it welcomed immigrants and migrants from all over the colonies and all over the world, saying to them, we don't care where you're from, we don't care what you worship, you will be welcomed here to do work and be protected by the law. And this meant that people came here who were open to speculating in ideas and speculating in businesses. In fact, one man, John Hammett, leaves the Baptist faith and becomes a Quaker. In 1727, he publishes this small volume as a response, The Vindication and Relation, 
and it's Hammett giving his own account of this conversion process. Liberty of conscience shouldn't be confused with the fact that Roger Williams liked what everyone was thinking. He certainly did not. And he had heated debates with Quakers in particular about what they were thinking. Now, this is 1727. Roger Williams has passed. But what it meant was he could disagree with the Quakers. He could detest what they believed. But he felt he had no right to keep them from practicing that faith. And Hammett is a man who, are, who is an example of how you can even migrate from one faith to the next, and no one understood that more than Roger Williams. But one of the more important things to us, at least in, in the history of, of books and imprints here in Rhode Island, is that this is published in 1727, the first year that printing is being done in Rhode Island. And it's printed here and sold by James Franklin of Newport. James Franklin is the older brother of Ben Franklin, and it was to his brother James that Ben Franklin was apprenticed and learned the printing trade. So this is one of three books that survives from the 1727 printing, and the only copy, I believe, that, uh, that exists of John Hammett's relation. As we move forward, we go into some of the more cultural aspects of Rhode Island's history in the 18th century, and something that I find utterly delightful. One of the other sites that we have at the Rhode Island Historical Society is the John Brown House Museum. And we know that John Brown's daughter was married in 1788, and we have diary accounts of the country dances that she did. What we have here in our printed collection that shows the deep connections between the artifacts and the museums and the printed collections is the first printing, the only surviving copy we know of, the earliest collection of country dances and cotillions. And this is produced by the dance master of Providence, John Griffith. And it is a wonderful account of the dances that were being done, the newest and most fashionable the pleasure of love, the pleasure of providence, the new Ru Russia dance, the morning gazette, all of these wonderful dances that we know and can imagine the men and women of providence in the 1788 doing. And it's one of the strengths, I think, of, of historical society collections and libraries in general, is that they aren't just repositories of the works of illuminaries and great thinkers, such as a Roger Williams, but they really are places where people can find the cultural history and find out more about the daily life of everyday people and how they would have been expressing themselves, whether it's in word, in dance, in music, or in film in the 20th century. And the collections here have all of that, and I think this is a, a wonderful example of an early piece of our cultural history. The next piece we have harkens back a bit, even though it's a later period, it's uh, 1806. Many people might know that Rhode Island actually has the first synagogue in North America, the Truro Synagogue located in Newport. And so we have a very active Jewish community in Rhode Island from the 18th century on. And they become significant individuals uh, throughout the state's economy um, and its political life. What we have here, again an original binding, is the first printed Jewish calendar in North America. It shows, it's a lunar calendar, and it reflects on all of the festival days, all the days of significance, for a period of decades. And one of the really beautiful things about it is that there's also marginalia, there are notes in Hebrew throughout the, this um, binding. What we have before us now is a uh, a photo album, a scrapbook, from a Rhode Islander who Americans know probably better than they even know Roger Williams. And it's a man named Elijah Hunt Rhodes. He never did anything as spectacular as Williams or Clark or Nathaniel Green. What he was was a man who went to the Civil War and kept an amazing diary and record. And he was discovered by Ken Burns. And he became the model for Billy Yank in the Ken Burns Civil War series. And so we are fortunate enough here to have been given the Elijah Hunt Rhodes collection from his family. And this is one of the wonderful scrapbooks that we have from Elijah Hunt Rhodes. After he left the war, he went forward into the civil service. He became active in the uh, Grand Army of the Republic. He was an active Freemason. And he stayed engaged with the troops and with the war as the adjutant general. But he has these wonderful scrapbooks, and this is really a portrait book, if you will, of 
other, the Major General Frank Wheaton, Lieutenant General Philip Sheridan, and really just an absolutely lovely collection. Here he is as Brigadier General Elijah Hunt Rhodes. And that's sort of how I think of him the most and the way that we envision him. He goes out as this young man and has a calamitous series of, of getting shot, but it, it, the bullet gets stuck in his Bible and all of these wonderful stories that make him very real to us. He becomes engaged and his romance with his fiancée is complemented from books like this as well as then the artifacts that we have, such as the wristlets and wrist warmers that she knit for him and sent off to him while he was at war. And in the midst of this wonderful collection of photos, we have his horse. And in this amazing place of honor with all of these major generals, we have Kate. And he would never have had a place of honor for the soldiers of the Civil War without recognizing the incredible role that his horse played in that. And the last thing we're going to look at in this collection are some wonderful examples of jewelry design. Rhode Island is an industrial capital in the 19th century and into the 20th century, right up until about the middle of the century. It's probably best known for its textile industry, but in fact, by the turn of the 20th century, Rhode Island really is the jewelry capital of America. And nowhere better to learn that or teach that, that at the Rhode Island School of Design. They began by studying industrial design, but they quickly turned into having a wonderful jewelry design department. And what we have here is a book written by one of the teachers at the Rhode Island School of Design, Augustus F. Rose. We can see this is his textbook, Jewelry Making and Design, that he comes out with while he is running the department there at RISD. He had been working for years and uh, making tools related to the jewelry trade. So for some periods in his life, he's making anvils and he's making the heavier tools. But we can see the real artistry that's going on in the jewelry uh, design and jewelry uh, manufacturing area as we see beautiful pieces from 1905, from the early part of the 20th century that show the Art Nouveau influence, um, show the maritime influence in Rhode Island, and really illustrate very well the fine craftsmanship and fine detail of manufacturing that we could see in Providence at the turn of the 20th century. Rose, again, is a prominent figure. Manufacturers and designers are some of the most prominent individuals in Rhode Island at the time. He, again, is an active Freemason and begins a family in Rhode Island and stays here and really helps to shape the beautiful jewelry making scene that became so important um, throughout the 20th century in Rhode Island. Each one of these pieces tells an amazing story of part of, our, again, our national history. We have the beginning and founding stories that help us understand the ideology with which our nation was shaped, that set us apart from other countries. And as we struggle, I think, to understand our place as we move forward, it's helpful to us to reflect back on what the real grounding principles actually were, rather than exaggerated or misunderstood versions of, of the founders' intents. And I think Roger Williams represents uh, a departure from that normal story and shows how even a small colony can have uh, had a great impact on the way the race, rest of the nation and the world thought. Um, works by men like John Barry, uh, his recent book on the creation of the American soul and Roger Williams. Being able to come to a repository like this to see the collection, see the writings of, of Roger Williams, he was able to learn what other historians are, learn, are learning about Roger Williams. He wrote important works, and there's very little evidence that Thomas Jefferson was reading Roger Williams. But he was then able to go to a library and archive in England. And they, too, had documents, and they had library records, and they had roles. And he was able to see there that John Locke was reading Roger Williams. And if Thomas Jefferson was reading Locke, we start to see how these ideas were transatlantic, we're moving all over the world well before we think of the global exchange that we have today. These other books show us how people were living, how they were interacting with each other. They also show us how we shaped our economy as we again struggle with how we redefine ourselves to new economies, to new political structures throughout the world. 
we can come to places like this and we can understand how adjustments were made, how a community could redefine itself and take advantage of opportunities that might not have existed before. And what I love so much about libraries and about history and about research is five people can look at the same book and walk away with five completely different stories and interpretations, seeing what's important to them and making it into something that is relevant for an unimaginable number of communities. So we might say that history is a set of facts, but really history is an interpretation. And libraries are the places where people can come and immerse themselves in that. And I believe deeply in the importance of digital repositories as well. It allows greater access. It allows people to zoom into things that they would never be able to see so closely before. But I believe there is truly something amazing and magical about a personal communion with an artifact, a book, an imprint from the past as we hold a book that maybe Roger Williams held, as we hold in our hands the life's work, the photo album that Elijah Hunt Rhodes put together as he remembered the Civil War. I think it transports us and it's the closest thing to a time machine that I've ever found. So I find it an absolutely delightful opportunity to be able to be immersed in the world of history. And that's what you can do at a library like this.